Thank you everyone for uh, taking the time to stop by Pure during your trip. Hopefully this will be uh, one of your more memorable engagements with the vendors. Uh, I know many of you because we've engaged over the years at, at a number of virtualization related uh, events. My name is Vaughn Stewart and um, I have the role here of being Chief Evangelist. I spent a number of years in the storage industries focusing specifically around cloud and server virtualization and I want to help share with you um, some of what we do from a technology perspective as it relates specific, specifically to cloud, private cloud adoption or virtual infrastructure depending on the term that you want to use. And so I start with an, a, a question which is, does anyone love storage in the virtualization space? And the question's rather rhetorical because we know the answer is no. There's a significant amount of frustration in this space by the VMware administrators. There was, when the paradigm shifted and, and we stopped deploying physical systems and we moved to virtual, there was this, this uncovering of, uh, or you could say exposure to the storage layer from the VMware administrative team. And I think there was a lot of, of lack of understanding at that point in time uh, and a lot of the dynamic elements that we received at the compute, network, memory layer weren't the same at the storage layer. And so I want to share with you a bit about a timeline and level set in terms of how technologies mo morphed and maybe this will help you understand how I think we at Pure see the world specifically around providing storage services under a virtual infrastructure. So if you wind back the clock, and we'll start with 2006, and we'll take this, this period of 2006 through 2010. Why 2006? It was June of that year that VMware released VI3. That arguably was the launching point for mass or broad adoption of the VMware technology across enterprise data centers. Uh, that's where many customers started in their labs, their test and development environments, moved into the production use case, typically targeted second and third tier types of applications. At that point in time, there was this revelation of, wow, I get to create big pools of storage and carve it up as virtual machines and storage is now a file and I can move it around and I can have availability and migration capabilities that weren't available to us. And quickly, customers kind of ran head first into <coughs> performance bottlenecks. Storage infrastructures, specifically the SANs at that time, weren't designed for maximum uh, I.O. sharing between different hosts. You know, case in point, there was per LUN level Q, Q depths. At that time, if you take a common mid-tier array and you did a RAID 5, 4 plus 1 configuration, you'd have a queue depth of 84. 84 is not a very demanding or very high-level queue depth for an individual virtual machine, for an individual server. Try running five virtual machines on it, right? You'd run into bottlenecks. Compounding that was the enabling technology in, in the areas of clustered file systems. Right? Had a lot of overhead in terms of SCSI reservations, right? file locking mechanisms. And so together, we had this great enablement of technology, but we couldn't drive a lot of performance out of it. That was also the time frame, I should say, when the whole SAN NAS debate came up. And for some of you who understand my history in this space, I drove a lot of those conversations. Because during that time frame, NAS was better in terms of making a shared storage pool available to a multiple number of hosts and allowing you to get past these, what I will call artificial or hidden bottlenecks and let you tap out the maximum performance of the array and the disk subsystem that you were serving. Fast forward a few years, oops, I'll jump ahead here. And through elements like the vStorage APIs and changes with array architectures, moving from LUN-based queue depths to target-based queue depths, right, moving from 84 as our queue depth to 30,000 IL per, per port and having multiple ports on array, we got rid of the, the hidden bottlenecks within the IO stack. And now customers were driving right at disk and running into performance problems. And you saw then the evolution of new technologies to try to react to performance bottlenecks. Storage tiering, storage caching expansions, right? Tier 2 cache expansions. <coughs> Elements within the software stack around understanding when a, when a data store uh, was, was experiencing high latency and migrating some of the workload. In all of those technologies, you often had to weather the storm before there was any, any relief. I think the root cause when we boil back the state of storage with virtual infrastructure technology today is that the IT department has lost control of the endpoint. <coughs> no longer control what an administrator is doing inside of that virtual machine. You don't control what they do in terms of if they want to change the partitions, the file systems. You have no idea the block size of the applications that they run or what their business operation time frame is. 
I may have an application that runs almost dormant all year, all month long, and in the last day of the month maybe shoots up because it has some requirement to provide some form of report at the end of the month. How do you dynamically respond to that change in workload? I get some, some end users who, you know, today deploy virtual machines with very little uh, load on these systems and quickly they become mission critical. Again, how do I adapt, natively just adapt to the change in the workload? On the server and network side, that's very simple because there's a lot of dynamic elements there provided by the hypervisor. But those are also elements where the, the workload is transitive. I can easily hand off CPU cycles. I can easily hand off um, network packets. In the storage space, right, data is resident. I've got to deal with it in bulk. Right? I've got to deal with it as it continues to grow. And how do I make it more dynamic? Our belief and what we hope to share with you here is it's only available when you look at all Flash. Now, Flash is, being in, is driving a number of innovative technologies to help solve this problem. Be it hybrid storage arrays, right? All flash arrays is what we're talking as, as we are talking about today, or some new emerging server-centric based technologies. The expansion of host-side caching technologies, right? Be it from VMware or other startups. I believe you guys have spoken to some today or, or, or may as you go through the rest of your trip. <coughs> right? Or now this construct of converged storage, taking the direct attached disks inside of a server and bringing them together through software to build a storage platform. You can run an infrastructure in all of these technologies. That's not what we're here to discuss. What I'm here to, to share with you is how do you, someone who is responsible for running an IT department, whether you have an architect and a design function and responsibility, or you have an operational function like an IT administrator, how do you start to think strategically about technologies that will take you through the course of the next decade? Right. So hybrid arrays usually get looked at as just this another, another spinning disk array. It's increased the amount of cache that's available. It's tier two. Yes, it'll be faster than a, a disk array without, without cache. True. Most customers or, or prospects challenge flash arrays saying, it's too expensive. And it, or I don't need all that performance. You know, that's beyond what, what I need today. And I feel that if I purchase beyond what I need, I'm going to be paying for it. If I look at some of the host side caching technologies where the model is keep your old slow disk, place, disk array in, in place and instead add some software or a combination of software and hardware into the host and gain some caching mechanisms. The challenge with that is, is the ones that don't require you to add any, any flash and use server side memory. Anyone who's got any experience in the VMware space knows that the number one resource constraint in the server for VMware is memory. So you're starving a, an already uh, constrained resource. And if you're purchasing software and hardware to, to expand on this, somewhere around the eighth host that you in, in, enable, you could have just purchased an all-flash array. So, so you have to kind of understand where, where, are you, where are you building towards and are you building a model that you could just uh, uh, simplify the infrastructure. There's also a lot of coordination that has to go on with, with what I'm dealing with in the host side at the application layer, hypervisor layer, or even back in storage processes. And finally, on the converged storage platform, Right. Some of you may, may look at this, say Nutanix or vSAN. Right? The, the, the construct here is, hey, it's the Google model. This is how you get to web scale. You throw lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of hardware at it. And this, this model works very well uh, in terms of if you want to throw a lot of I.O. at it, as long as you have the facilities, the rack space, power, and cooling to store all this hardware. Most of these technologies have a minimum requirement of two copies of your data, recommended three copies of data, and sometimes the high-end architects actually say for full availability, you need four copies. We're going to show you as we go through this, this conversation today, for virtual infrastructures, we average between five to one and nine to one data reduction. So we are running somewhere between a tenth and a twentieth of what that footprint would be in the data center. So again, I challenge you, think like a CIO, think strategically, and look at all the technologies and understand how they work. Now, of the four technologies I've shared with you, three of them truly are hybrid technologies. They're either placing an expansion of flash technology either in the storage controller itself, which will help alleviate the load on the disk, based, the disk backend, or they put the flash in the host itself and they alleviate the total I.O. load on the controller itself, or they're taking all the storage elements and putting it inside the servers themselves and having a, a SSD or flash-based tier followed by disk for a capacity layer. The challenge with hybrid models, regardless of which form that you buy them in, 
is they are no different at the end of the day than what you've had in terms of experience with the SAN, with the exception of you have a larger cache capacity. And thus you have to look at constructs like Little's Law. Little's Law is a mathematical equation that's used widely throughout the IT industry to understand what the total throughput capabilities and performance capabilities are, whether I'm looking at a networking technology, developing software, uh, and see how it runs and is optimized on a CPU, or whether I'm developing storage. And Little's Law basically takes three elements. It looks at the average load on a system, what the average time it takes to traverse the system, and then it looks at probability distribution, or in storage terms, what percentage of that workload is being served from cache versus being served from disk. Bon. Yes. I spent 10 years as a CIO. Yep. So I actually do think like a CIO. <laughs> um, and when I look at solutions, I look at, I mean, I look at the, obviously the market as a whole these days. Yep. And I see use cases for pretty much all of it. But if I'm thinking as a CIO, I'm also thinking about what I have as far as budget. Absolutely. I have to be realistic about that. I, I, I've had horror stories about where I said, here's my budget for something. I've had something come in 10 times that. There's a cost of entry that has to be considered to do all these things. Let's go to this, right? Right? So it would seem to me that the cost of entry for the all flash array is probably going to be on the higher end of looking at those four things, all other things being equal. Uh, 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 True. With the understanding that they're all going to do dedupe, they're all going to do compression. I mean, obviously, there's different levels of that. Nutanix doesn't do dedupe on the, the capacity tier. SimpliVity does. Let's take all that out of the equation for right now. But when you look at even some of the other hybrid players, they're all doing dedupe on both the capacity and performance tiers. So it, I, um, I think that there are use cases for all flash arrays, absolutely. But is, would you agree that the all flash array is going to still be on the higher side of the buy-in, the barrier to entry is going to be cost initially, or is there ways to overcome that um, with, with a solution like this? So uh, thank you for raising the point. Uh, allow me to elaborate uh, on a couple of the items that you raised. OK. Um, again, I think you can run your data center on any of these technologies. And I think all of these technologies will probably provide for you a better experience than the existing two or th three year old storage array that would be in a, that you'd find in a traditional data center today. Right. Some of that just happens to do with faster processors, right? <coughs> uh, 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 more more throughput on the back end, right? Newer newer storage technologies, and of course this expansion in terms of the flash real estate within all of these architectural designs. From a perspective of of barriers to adoption, I think if you look at a uh, technology like a DAS based solution where you're buying uh, exponentially more hardware for a distributed DAS solution than you are a flash ray, plus the software to deploy that solution. Um, I don't think the difference is that, um, is that far off because it's not like you can start with one server and build forward. There's a minimum requirement in terms of number of nodes. Right. And now there's a, store, a concept of like, I can scale linearly on nodes. Well, that's very similar to us, which is you're gonna come in a minimum configuration of two controllers and a half, half, half populated shelf and you'll be able to add uh, SSDs uh, over time, you'll be able to expand it with more shelves and roll forward. And at some point in time, if you capacitate the frame, you'll start with another set of controllers. Well, that's no different than in a converged uh, infrastructure design where when I reach the, reach the maximum node limit, I now have to buy a collection of nodes again and start another cluster. So there's always this, these you know, large, large entry points into any solution, some, f some framework in which you scale up, and then you capacitate the design and you have to move forward. You said challenges, so I want to, I want to <laughs> you put that up right on the what? slide, so I want to yeah. add another point. On the converged storage side, like let's, let's look at a Nutanix SimpliVity or even like a Max to type, type deal. Um, you still are gonna have to have hosts, right? Sure. So I, I would look at those as basically a phasing in sort of an opportunity rather than a rip and replace. I'm not gonna forklift upgrade everything I've got in my data center I'm going to basically phase those kinds of things in so that that server cost is something I was going to eat anyway. That I have to buy those hosts for vSphere or Hyper-V or whatever you're going to run. <clears throat> um, so that's, to me, that, that excess hardware argument, I'm not sure if that, if you're looking at just um, the storage equation, 
if if it's if it's that easy to compare the two. But are you buying? The question would be, but are you buying twenty four <laughs> disk drives with each server that you're deploying today? Oh the no, I'm that not. Is, you're is absolutely no. right. I'm buying a flash um, card that I'm. You're not paying off. for for whatever the software license is for that architecture today as well. Correct. And again, understand that the usable capacity. In, in, in those solutions are going to be less than because half. Because of the replica-based nature of yeah, the data protection. A minimum less than half. And that I absolutely I agree with, yeah. Okay. And there's, there's, those are some of the challenges they have because right. rate parity calculation is too much CPU overhead. So if you, if you look, and this is public knowledge, if you look at the data center growth rates of companies like Google, mm -hmm. Yahoo, Facebook, Amazon, all these tech companies leverage scale-out architectures using commodity hardware. I had the fortune to sit down with, with uh, an executive who happened to be at uh, one of the large web scale companies who was responsible for facilities. And he asked us to please help them, help their engineers understand that while they've made storage inexpensive from the way they measure it, he's building now new data centers, billion dollar data centers on nine month intervals. And that, that schedule runs very similar to all the web scale companies. Right. I think that is probably the biggest challenge to a distributed DAS architecture, which is enterprises by and large across the globe, particularly enterprises or the mid-sized businesses, tend to be out of real estate in their data center, real estate being rack space, right? or they're out of power. And whether that power is, is, is running the IT systems or is used to cool the IT systems, it, it's, that, that's just an, a, a knob that you adjust one way or the other. When you look towards flash, versus a distributed architecture. Performance aside, which we haven't, we haven't uh, entered into, we were starting to, the fact that I would fill up rack space at an accelerated rate versus being able to reduce that curve, I would generate more heat and greater requirements for the other resources in the data center. It's counterintuitive to the green initiatives of, of most organizations. And, and I <coughs> think in time, that technology, you'll probably see wide adoption in areas like small business, remote office. I mean, I think it's fantastic if you have a remote office and you need three servers or something along those lines, four servers, to not have to buy a storage array with it. That might be ideal. Right. But I think wide-scale deployment, and, and I'm sure they're going to exist. And I think wide-scale deployment and the impact of it doesn't come till later when someone says, we're out of rack space in the data center. What, how do you address this? You either reverse the trend and look at highly efficient flash technology to bring down both the footprint and the power. And cooling. And the cooling requirements. Or you build new data centers. There's significant price differences at, at that level. But it's, it's also a lot more fun to build data centers. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so let me go forward here a bit because I'm going to run out of time. So let's look at some, some data um, in terms of these technologies by and large. Uh, the top vertical bar is looking at a traditional disk array. And as you can see here, uh, as we go from left to right, we are measuring in terms of time. On the left, what we see is some vertical blue bars showing the percentage of I.O. that is serviced from the cache on the array and thus has a very, uh, short late or very low level of latency or high level of responsiveness. And as, as I.O. requests aren't being serviced from cache, they're coming from disk and they're slow, thus the blue bars on the right. If I expand the cache in the array, thus hybrid, right, at a tier two cache, you can see that I increase the number of cache hits that are coming out of cache, which, which is good, and I'm raising the performance of the array, but I still at times have a large amount of the workload that hits disk, and that's the slowest point in the system. If I go down to the third bar where I have disk-based array with a host side cache, um, I still have a very similar mix in terms of cache hit ratios and disk, and the cache hit ratios, yeah, because it's local, maybe that's coming at, at, a, at a quicker response time, but understand that most transactions are serialized in nature. And this is where we come back to with Little's law. I can have a 90% cache hit ratio coming back in, in the framework of microseconds. It's that 10% that has to go out to the 20 millisecond spinning disk that negates all of it because you are waiting for all of the I.O. to clear to complete the transaction. And so what we are saying with you is, is Again, these technologies work well. They benchmark really very well if you can keep a workload in, ca in, in cash. In the real world where you can't plan for the unexpected, then you should expect un unexpected results. What we've shown from you here on the bottom uh, of this chart the, is the amount of cash hit ratios that occur between 250 microseconds and 1.5 milliseconds. 
Flash isn't about performance. All Flash systems are fast. I actually get, <coughs> um, I'm not very interested in conversations around Flash and which methods are faster or slower. All Flash is about the consistent delivery of I.O. to your applications. It's a required in element in the infrastructure as, you, as CIOs look to that next generation of applications that they deploy. But it's also a way to, to increase the availability and responsiveness of existing applications so that they are more web-like in nature in terms of being on 24-7 and supporting a more remote and mobile workforce. So I know that you've seen something similar to this. How am I doing on time? You have 10 minutes. I have 10 months. I've got to pick up my pace. Something similar to this from Kix's presentation. These are kind of the elements that we focus on with, with virtualization within the, within the array. Let's, let's make it provide high performance, consistent delivery in terms of latency. We're going to provide it for you at an economic price point. We're going to make it plug and play simple. And that simplicity element is actually where we get into some of the demos towards the end that Joel's going to share with you. So I want to cover with you kind of a key element, which is the economics, ele uh, economics element. If you recall, when I put up the four boxes showing the technologies, usually the biggest incumbent to considering Flash is someone says, it's, all, it's just fast, right? I, I've seen a price tag on a violin memory system, for example. I've seen Texas memory systems. Heck, you know, even if you look at EMC now with Extreme I.O., they now have a non-deduplicated version available for you, which is, we'll turn off the dedupe. I'm not quite sure that's kind of going counter to their initial launch, which was to drive uh, more cost effectiveness into their platform. Uh, it's a reversal in direction. It's very interesting. We have a, a ticker that runs on our website that shares with you that our install base is, is receiving across all applications greater than six to one data reduction. Now that blue bar shows you uh, uh, thin provision savings added on top of that at around 13 to one. Thin provisioning is not really a means to, to reduce data, so let's not focus on that technology. It's, it's a dynamic means of provisioning storage. So I want to share with you a little bit around uh, data reduction. And by no means is this the deepest part of the conversation. Following me will be Neil, who's going to take you through a lot of additional depths in terms of the conversation around Flash Medium, how it's handled, how reads and writes uh, are, are put in place, and he may touch base on some of this. <coughs> so five forms of data reduction. We lead the industry in this area from, from providing these technologies. These all work together and help us address the broadest market set. So first is inline data deduplication at a 512 byte level of granularity. This allows us to provide data storage savings that historically hasn't been possible, right? I have a history at, at, before coming to Pure at NetApp of, of providing 4K DDU post-process. Great success and drove a lot of market share in the VMware space because of that. With 512 granularity, we can provide even greater storage savings than that. For example, being able to data deduplicate between two virtual machines when one has a, a misaligned partition, one has an aligned partition. That's not possible on a 4K boundary. It is on a 512 byte boundary. Second is inline data compression. We use a, a, a lightweight form of compressing data that allows us to ensure our performance so that we can reduce the data on ingest, right? have basically no text in terms of inflation when it's served back out. And that works in line with the data, data compression to drive down, the, two to drive down the, the size of the data set. The two technologies, as Matt had shared, have different impacts depending on the type of data set, and I will share with you some information on that on the next <coughs> slide. Following compressions, we do two forms of inline, additional inline data reduction. One is called pattern removal, and one is zero removal. This actually occurs at an 8-bit level, and is handled as data is, is being acknowledged, writes are being acknowledged from the system in NVRAM, and it's, it's reducing this data set without it going and actually validating the data on SSD like it would if it was data, uh, part of the data dedu process. I gotta pick up my pace here because uh, we're getting surrounded. And last, we have a format of post-process compression. And this is actually something that's very interesting is we have a, a patent pending on our implementation of the post-process compression, which is, is a deep form of compression. It allows us to layer these technologies together and to be used in, in, the, in the massaging of the SSDs and the data that's stored on them that when we actually have to go through the, the SSD optimization processes, which Neil will cover, we actually reduce the data footprint even further. These five technologies together allow us to, to address a, a wider market than what's available without them. The chart that you see behind me 
shows you the data, total data reduction or total storage savings across our entire install base. Kix pulled this data at the beginning of November of last year. Our install base has grown, so we probably need to do a refresh on this. What you can see is that each vertical bar has been categorized based on the data reduction ratios, starting at 2 to 1 on the left and incrementing from 3 to 1, 4 to 1, etc., all the way up to 10 to 1, and we get to the 10 to 1 and we go past it, we start to increment in larger chunks, 10 to 15, um, 15 to 20, and a greater than 20. What you see here is the color bands. The orange bars are what's the storage or the data reduction savings provided by compression. In blue, what's the data reduction provided by deduplication. What I've added across the bottom is classification of the applications. On the far left side of the chart, what you see is databases and applications tend to not deduplicate very well, but do tend to benefit significantly from compression. This would be Oracle databases, any type of application that you would run inside of a virtual machine, etc. On the far right hand side of the chart, where you see extremely high data reduction ratios and the, the majority of the savings is provided to you by data deduplication, these are where applications leverage the same set of, infra of data uh, through multiple instances. This could be virtual desktop infrastructure. This could be an SAP environment where you've got a QA, a sandbox, a test dev, right? All these copies of the same version of data. We can massively reduce that footprint. In the center is what we're talking about today is the sweet spot. Five to one to nine to one data reduction for virtual infrastructures. We leverage heavily data deduplication to reduce the binary footprint, the redundant copies of operating systems, application sets that are, that are installed in each of these systems as well as then compression to reduce the application that's stored inside, the size of the application data that's stored inside of these virtual machines. The gray bar shows you our install base and where they are in terms of, of receiving these benefits. Now, by contrast, if we turned off compression, you can see where our data savings go. And this is a direct correlation to our, our this would directly correlate or impact our ability to reduce the price of flash for our customers. This is why the five technologies together are so important. I'm running out of time, so I want to, real quick here, let you know that we've also built a stateless architecture design. It is a symmetric active-active array, and we've limited the, the, the throughput architecture to that of one storage controller. That means in any event, be it planned downtime or you know, when, when the unplanned you know, raises its head and, and pays you a visit, performance doesn't drop because now we will leverage 100% of the CPU and memory resources on a controller. <coughs> the stateless architecture moves the NVRAM that you've known in a lot of systems that tends to be in the storage controllers and puts it in the storage shelves. This allows us to provide hardware expansions, upgrades, software upgrades, and even controller upgrades between different versions of the controllers without ever inter impacting operations. This is critical from a perspective of when I'm in the cloud or a virtual infrastructure, I am used to never having downtime. This allows me to go through my storage life cycle, expanding it, adding new capacity, more performance, new feature sets, without having to evict data stores, right? without having to do mass migrations of hundreds or thousands of virtual machines. Everything stays in place because the representation of the array is logical. The hardware is, is a, a level that below it that we're working at. So with that, I'm going to skip um, some here on cloud support because I'm running out of time. I'm going to skip this use case and share with you that, that our goal is to provide the, the performance of Flash in terms of uh, the promise of Flash, which is, is a combination of, of massive performance, but more importantly, consistent delivery of latency to all your applications to make it uber simple and make you not have to worry about configurations and retroactive data management technologies. And we will dive into that deeper in some of the demos that Joel is going to have. With that, it's time for me to hand off to Neil.